In the first section of this video, we're going to introduce multivariate random variables. This is a lot of information for one video, so we'll try to keep it introductory and high level. This section covers 23 to 30% of the syllabus, so that's from 7 to 9 questions. This video starts off with an introduction to multivariate random variables, so mainly we'll be talking about the bivariate case. We'll define joint distributions, talk about marginal distributions and conditional distributions, and covariance and correlation. We'll define IID random variables and how they apply to order statistics, specifically the minimum and maximum. Finally, we'll talk about the central limit theorem and review the normal distribution. Let's get started. A multivariate random variable is a random variable that simultaneously models more than one outcome. So for example, if you want to model both the height and weight of a person, you can use a multivariate random variable. In this case, since there's two variables, this would be a bivariate random variable. Also, as of September 2022, the exam only tests discrete bivariate random variables, so there won't be any questions on bivariate continuous random variables. Similar to univariate random variables, bivariate random variables also have a probability mass function. This function is the joint probability mass function, or PMF, or the joint distribution. This distribution represents the probability that x takes on a value lowercase x and y takes on a value lowercase y. Let's take a look at two examples. In the first example, we define the joint PMF with a case equation. We specify the probability for each pair xy, so the probability that x equals 1 and y equals 1 is 0 0.1, the probability that x equals 1 and y equals 2 is 0 0.2, and so on. Similar to the conditions for a unit-variate discrete random variable, the sum of all probabilities over all values of x and y must total 1, and each probability must range from 0 to 1. In this example, both conditions are met, so this is a valid joint PMF. Another way you can see this written is as a 2x2 two two matrix, where either the columns or the rows represent x or y. Within the matrix are the probabilities. In the second example, we have a case function again. In this case, the probability is a function of x and y, rather than a constant number. This PMF also satisfies both conditions, so I just wanted to show here that the probability does not always have to be a constant number. Also similar to unit variate discrete random variables, the joint distribution also has a cumulative distribution function, or CDF. The CDF represents the probability that x is less than or equal to a value lowercase x, and y is less than or equal to a value lowercase y. So going back to the first example from earlier, to calculate the CDF from the PMF, we have to go through each of these cases one by one. In the first case where xy equals 1, 1, to calculate the CDF, we start with the PMF and sum up all values where both x and y are less than or equal to 1. And in this case, this is just 0 0.1. For xy equals 1, 2, we sum up all cases in the PMF where x is less than or equal to 1 and y is less than or equal to 2. So this would be 0 0.1. 1 plus 0 0.2. We can apply the same logic for xy equals 2, 1 and xy equals 2, 2 to get 0 0.4 and 1 respectively. And so the joint CDF is what you see on screen. One technicality to keep in mind is that the CDF is defined for all real values of x and y. And this also applies to the discrete case where the CDF is defined for all real values of x. So that means that the support of x and y must be defined in intervals. The next chapter covers marginal distributions. Each variable in a joint distribution has its own marginal distribution. In the bivariate case, there is a marginal distribution for x and a marginal distribution for y. So let's say your joint distribution modeled the height and weight of a person, but you only wanted the probability of a certain height. Then the marginal distribution can be used to find that probability. Let's take a look at an example to see how this works. Here we're given a table of values representing the joint distribution of x and y, and we're asked to calculate the marginal distribution of x and y. To find the marginal distribution of x, we sum up all probabilities where x equals 0, x equals 1, and x equals 2. So respectively, those values are 0 0.25, 0 0.45, and 0 0.3. Similarly, for the marginal distribution of y, we can sum up all values where y equals 0, y equals 1, y equals 2, and y equals 3. These values come out to be 0 0.3, 0 0.35, 0 0.2, and 0 0.15. In both cases, the total probability sums up to 1, and all probabilities fall within the range 0 to 1. So both s and y are valid univariate random variables. A special property to keep in mind is that if x and y are independent, then the product of the marginal distributions can get you back to the joint distribution. Otherwise, if x and y are not independent, you cannot go from the marginal distribution back to the joint distribution. This is because when you go from the joint distribution to the marginal distribution, information about the other variable is lost. However, if the two variables are independent, there's no loss of information. And so you can calculate the joint distribution from the marginal distributions or the marginal distributions from the joint distributions. 
The next section covers conditional probability distributions. For two random variables x and y, the conditional distribution of y given x is represented by this notation. This is the exact same notation used in Learning Objective 1 for conditional probabilities. In this case, rather than working with straight up probabilities, we're working with probability distributions. The conditional distribution of y, given that x takes on a specific value, is equal to the joint distribution divided by the probability that x takes on that specific value. So for example, if lowercase x equals 0, then the probability of y given that x equals 0 is then just a function of y. And so because it's only a function of one variable, it then reduces down to a unit vari random variable. From there, we can calculate the CDF, the expected value, moments, and variance using the formulas from the univariate case. So looking at an example here, we're given the joint PMF of the annual number of tornadoes in counties P and Q, and we're asked to calculate the conditional variance of the annual number of tornadoes in county Q, given that there are no tornadoes in county P. So first we calculate the conditional probability for county Q, given that P equals zero. For each value of Q from zero to three, the probability of Q given that P equals zero is equal to the joint probability divided by the probability that P equals zero. From here, we have a probability distribution just in terms of Q. So we can apply the univariate formulas to the conditional distribution to get the expected value, the second moment, and the variance. So for example, in step two, when we calculate the mean, this is just taking the mean of the distribution from step one. Similarly, in step three, this is just taking the second moment of the distribution from step one. Then finally, in step four, we can calculate the variance by taking the second moment minus the expected value squared. So the general approach in this question is to find the conditional distribution from the joint distribution. This distills the problem down into a question with one variable, and from there you can apply the unit variate rules to solve the question. Moving on to covariance and correlation coefficient. In the case with one variable, the variance measures the deviation from the mean squared. The covariance extends from the variance and measures how two random variables vary together. The first formula provides an intuitive understanding of the covariance. The second formula might be an easier way to calculate the covariance when solving questions. The covariance gives us some information about the relationship between x and y. So if the covariance is positive, x and y tend to move in the same direction. If the covariance is negative, they tend to move in inverse directions. One important formula to know is what you see on screen. This formula allows you to calculate the variance of a linear combination of x and y. Similar to the variance, the covariance is not a normalized metric. For a normalized metric, we can use the correlation coefficient, which always has a value that ranges from negative 1 to 1. Let's take a look at an example that uses both the covariance and the correlation coefficient. The question reads, an actuary analyzes a company's annual personal auto claims N and annual commercial auto claims N. The analysis reveals that the variance of M is 1600, the variance of N is 900, and the correlation between M and N is 0.64. Calculate the variance of M plus N. This question is really just plug and chug. We can use the last few equations we went over to calculate the variance of m plus n. Since we're given the correlation coefficient and the variance of m and the variance of n, we can plug these values into the formula to solve for the covariance of m and n. Now that we have the covariance, we can plug that in to calculate the variance of m plus n, which gets us 4036. Before finishing the remaining chapters in this section, we first define IID random variables. IID random variables are independent and identically distributed. IID random variables all follow the same probability distribution and are independent from each other. From IID random variables, we can then calculate order statistics. When working with IID random variables and order statistics, the exam is not just limited to discrete random variables. You can create order statistics from IID random variables when you sort them from lowest to highest. On the exam, if you get a question on order statistics, most likely it'll either be asking about the minimum or the maximum. So that would be the lowest or the highest. Let's go through a quick derivation for the CDF of the minimum order statistic. If we assume that there are n iid random variables all with cdf capital f of x then the probability of any of those variables being greater than a specific value of lowercase x is 1 minus f of x and that's because the cdf represents the probability that your random variable is less than or equal to a specific value 1 minus that represents the probability that a random variable is greater than a specific value 
From there, if there are, say, n order statistics and they are all independent and identical, then the probability that the minimum order statistic is greater than a specific value is just equal to the probability that all of the order statistics are greater than that value. And because they're independent, we can multiply the probabilities to get the probability that the minimum order statistic is greater than x is equal to 1 minus f of x raised to the n. Since this calculates the probability that the minimum is greater than x, to get the CDF, which represents the probability that x is less than or equal to lowercase x, we take 1 minus this value. We can also get the PDF from the CDF by taking the derivative and using the chain rule. We can also derive the formula for the maximum order statistic in a similar way. The CDF of the maximum order statistic is just f of x raised to the n. The PDF is derived in a similar way using the chain rule. Once you have the PDF, you can calculate the expected value or the variance in the usual way. The next section of this video covers the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem states that for a sufficiently large sample size, sometimes the number 30 is used, the distribution of the average or the sum of these random variables will approximate a normal distribution. Before using the central limit theorem, there are a few prerequisites. The first is that the underlying distributions must be IID. So all the underlying distributions must be identical and independent. So that means they must all have the same mean, which we'll call mu, and the same variance sigma squared. Another condition is that the underlying distributions cannot be extremely skewed or have heavy tails. This won't really be an issue on exam P because on exam P, if you get a question where you know you're going to have to use the central limit theorem, you're going to end up using the central limit theorem. In terms of notation, if we let n be the number of IID random variables, then we can write the average of these distributions as x bar sub n, where the average is a simple arithmetic average. Then as n approaches infinity, the distribution of the average approaches a normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma squared divided by n. For sufficiently large n, say n over 30, then the average approximates a normal distribution. The central limit theorem also applies to sums as well as averages. This means that similar to the average, the sum of x1 through xn approximates makes a normal distribution with mean n times mu and variance n times sigma squared. From here, if the question asks for a probability, we have to first standardize the normal random variable. This is because the normal distribution doesn't have a simple closed form solution for the CDF. So to calculate probabilities, we have to first transform the normal distribution into a standard normal distribution with mean 0 and variance 1. Then we can use the standard normal table to look up the probabilities. The standard normal table is provided on the exam. We can transform any normal distribution into a standard normal distribution using the formula you see on screen. Let's look at an example to see how this works. The question gives us the expected value, variance, and covariance of two random variables x and y, which represent the number of hours a randomly selected person watches movies and sporting events, respectively. We're also given that the total number of hours that different individuals watch movies and sporting events is mutually independent. So if we let w represent the total hours x plus y, then if we sample 100 people with distribution w, these samples are independent of each other. This is not saying that x and y are independent. We're also given that 100 people are sampled and t is the total number of hours for these 100 people. We're asked to approximate the probability that t is less than 7100. So right off the bat, we know to use the central limit theorem because of the word approximate. First, we need to calculate the mean and variance of w. From there, we can approximate the distribution of t using the central limit theorem. And then finally, we can standardize t and use the standard normal table to calculate the probability that t is less than 7100. First, we calculate the expected value of w. Since we're given the expected value of x and y, we can simply sum these up to get the expected value of w, which is 70. Next, we calculate the variance of w. Since the covariance is not 0, we know that x and y are not independent. So the variance of x plus y is equal to the variance of x plus the variance of y plus 2 times the covariance of x and y. And that gets us 100. Now we have a series of 100 IID random variables with mean 70 and variance 100. Recognizing that t is the sum of these 100 IID random variables, we can use the central limit theorem to find that the mean of t is equal to n times mu, which is 100 times 70, and the variance of t is n times sigma squared, which is 100 times 100. We have that t is normally distributed with mean 7,000 and variance 10,000, or standard deviation 100. We can now standardize t to a standard normal distribution, so z equals t minus the mean 7,000 divided by the standard deviation 100. Since we want the probability that t is less than 7,100, we also standardize 7100. So 7100 minus 7000 divided by 100 equals 1. This number is also known as the z-score. 
Using the z-score, we can now use the standard normal table that's provided during the exam to look up the probability that z is less than 1. The standard normal table shows the probability that a standard normal distribution is less than a value z. So using the table, a z-score of 1.00 gives a probability of 0.8413. And so equivalently, the probability that t is less than 7100 is also 0.8413. That concludes the video on Learning Objective 3 and the YouTube crash course. If there's anything I missed, feel free to leave a comment in the description below and I will respond as soon as I can. Thanks for watching and good luck studying.